Good morning. Welcome to our pre-cal video 1.D. This is the fourth time I've tried to record this. Announcements keep going off. So if another announcement comes on, I'm sorry. I really have restarted this a million times. And at this point, I just want to get through it. So today we are focusing on Descartes' rule of signs, bounds of zeros, and we are focusing on multiple theorems. Uh, just a brief reminder that we are, um, we have this syllabus change and also, if you're watching this video in time, this Friday, we're going to just briefly go over Descartes and Bounds and kind of practice that, get it out of the way. If you don't see this video in time, it's okay. I will go over this concept in class. And there's another one. Okay. And next week, we'll focus on theorems, and then we'll review and take our test. So Descartes' rule of sign here is that awesome formal definition. But... I don't really care about the formal definition in this class right now. I care how do I use it and what is its purpose. So here is how I use it. And so basically I'm looking for a sign change. That's the whole purpose of this. We're looking for sign change. What does all this nonsense mean? It means if I decide at the end I have five possible positive or negative real zeros, whatever, then I'm also going to say that I also have three because I subtracted two possible real zeros. I also have one because I subtracted two possible real zero. You will always uh, subtract by two until you reach zero or pass zero. So let's see what that looks like because this is kind of confusing right now. If I have this function, how can I evaluate the potential positive and, and negative solutions? So if I'm just shooting blind and I'm like, I know that there are solutions, but I don't know where to start. We can start by figuring out, do I have positive, negative, blah, blah, blah. So how do I do that? Well, we're going to evaluate x as a positive and x as a negative. The positive one is nice and simple in this one. It gives us back the same function, so we're good to go there. What about the negative one? Well, let's look at that negative x cubed for just a second. Negative x times negative x times negative x still returns a negative, so a negative times a negative becomes positive. So now I think you guys can figure out how I created this, this line down here. Now we just see where is there a sign change. For instance, from negative to positive, that's my first sign change, but I've already shown all three, so there are my sign changes. But what does all of this mean? So let's interpret it. Let's interpret the positive one first. I see two sign changes. That must mean that there are possibly two positive real solutions, real zeros. But not just two, because I subtract two away. So not just two, but also zero. So potentially two or potentially zero. What about the negative side? Okay, so I see one sign change. So I have one. If I subtracted two, I'd be past zero. So I have one possible negative real zero. But let's prove that to ourselves. So here are my two inferences. Let's look at a graph. And look at that. Negative 0 0.421. So there is my negative real zero. What about my positive? Do I have two positive solutions? Are there any solutions over here? No. So not two. Uh-oh. But I have zero. I did account for it. And that's all Descartes' rule of sign is saying. So we will practice this on Friday. What about bounds of zero? What if I'm just like shooting blind again? I have no idea where to start with my polynomial. Now I know that there are potentially zeros or however many possible zeros. But between what boundaries? What interval am I looking for? And that's what we do with this bound of zero. Okay, and here is the, that was the formal definition. And here is, you know, that kind of summary. What does this all mean? So looking at my example B, if I have this h of x function, where do I start? Well, I know that I have an interval from negative 1 to 7. Either I know this because you're given it on the question set, the teacher gives it to you, or we have a very brief sketch of the graph and we can kind of estimate where those boundaries are. Okay, but let's say we continue on. Um, we are going to first look for our possible zeros. And you guys might be looking at those going, whoa, where did all those numbers come from? That is a formula that you will see in the rational uh, zero theorem, which is coming, you know, many slides from now. So just get be hold your horses on where those came from for just a moment. Um, and just trust in me that I say that these are potential zero values. Okay, but before I can even touch the zeros, let's make sure our boundaries are correct. I said negative one and I said seven, but how do I know that those are true boundaries? What if it's shifted? What if I misinterpreted my graph? So I'm gonna test it using synthetic division and I've already done it for us. And all I have to know for the upper bound, or sorry, for the lower bound, we're gonna start with the lower bound, that negative one. All I have to know for the lower bound is that my signs alternate in the last line, in the quotient line. 
Okay, so 2, negative 13. 15, negative 59. 35, hey, positive, negative, positive, negative. It alternates. So I know that negative 1 is my lower bound. What about my upper bound? All I have to know is that all the lines on the bottom are non-negative. Y'all know that is positive, but 0 is neither positive or negative. So non-negative, it can include your 0. So 2, 3, 23, 117, 75, those are all non-negative. So 7 is my upper bound. So we start by testing our bounds. Then, since we've proven it down, we can narrow down that list. So here we had this massive list, but now since I know my boundary goes from negative 1 to 7, I eliminated the ones that didn't fit in that boundary. So now that I've eliminated these, we're going to synthetically divide until we hit a remainder 0 and then depress the polynomial and hit a remainder 0, et cetera, et cetera. But let's just assume we've already done that. Okay, and I've already figured out that the two values we know give us a remainder zero are six and negative one half. I didn't need to test negative one because that is my lower bound. Okay, so let me show you that proof. So I tested six, I got a remainder of zero. I know that this depressed to x cubed. So I grabbed these values and brought them over and tested negative one half. And now I know I'm depressed to the x squared, the one we're looking for, because I know I can try to factor or solve from there. So I've proven that there are two, those are two of my zeros that I like. So I know I can write it as such that if my zero is six, then to bring it back, it becomes X minus six. If my zero was negative one half, then to bring it back, it is uh, X plus one half, or you've got to do that solve where you deal with your coefficient. Either one is fine. Um, and then my remaining, where did this come from? And I'll go back a slide. That came from this. Right? Isn't that that information right there? So that is where that final factor came from. So now I have all of my factors. I cannot factor 2x squared plus 8 any further. I could I could factor out a 2 and get a, you know, bring a 2 all the way on the outside. That's all I could really do there. And I prove it to you on the right. Why do I know that x squared plus, uh, 2x squared plus 8 is going to be a funky is because if I set that equal to 0 and solve, I end up with irrational values, don't I? In fact, I think you end up with a complex number because it's the square root of negative 4. And so that's where you get that imaginary, that I value. And so you know that you've got an irrational value over there. So the only two real zero solutions would be six and negative one half. Okay, so moving on to what we're actually focusing on next week are our theorems. So some prior knowledge that we needed to have known is synthetic division. As you can see, we've been using it all video long. The formal definition of the fundamental theorem of algebra. That's a lot. Let's say it in other words. This is the polynomial theorem, which tells me that all of my properties are going to be that degree, okay, and our degrees are going to give us our potential number of roots. This doesn't mean that they have to be rational. They can be irrational, okay, so that's what I mean. Possible complex numbers are allowed, and we are going to use this to write it in its factored form, and you can write your factored form using the complex. So in the last one, I had that 2x squared plus 8. You could have written out your factor to include the i, and that would have been okay, okay? So let's look at something very simple. What are the roots of x squared minus 9? I don't think my graph was supposed to show up, but that's okay. So what are the roots of x squared minus 9? So my degree is 2. That means I have two solutions, two roots. So I set it equal to 0, move the 9 over, square root, and I end up with plus or minus 3. We agree with that, and the graph was supposed to prove it to us. But what about x squared plus 9. Same degree, same number of roots, but when I bring that negative 9 over, you already see the mistake. When I square root, what's going to happen? It's not that I cannot do it. It's now that we have complex values. So this isn't 3 and negative 3. It's 3i and negative 3i, those imaginary values, right? So let me prove it to you with the graph. Here's the graph, and you're like, hey, Miss Jag, I can see. It clearly never touches the x-axis, so of course there's no solutions. But where are those invisible solutions coming from? Well, let me show you the invisible thing. If I literally reflect the uh, polynomial that we're looking at over its vertex, my two invisible roots now show up. That's exactly what we're doing. Um, if, for those of you who like to see the concept behind things, this is what the image of an invisible root looks like. So, you know, there's a little bit more to that. It's, it's a little bit more complex than that, but some of us like to see conceptually what I'm talking about. That's really all the fundamental theorem of algebra is. It just tells you how, what is your degree? Those are your possible roots. Okay.
So the remainder theorem, this is actually something we're going to use. This is a very important concept in real world problems. So in other words, all of this nonsense, in other words, the remainder after dividing X minus C, you can just plug it in. So what does that mean? Let's see what that means by practicing a problem. If I'm given this problem, I could synthetically divide it. Absolutely. Blah, blah, blah. And we end up with a remainder of two. But... Okay, so now we know we have a remainder of 2 if I divide by x minus 3. But what if I wanted to just test that? What if I was like, what is the remainder just here? I don't want to know all the rest. I just need the remainder. Guess what? I can plug in that c value. My c value here, if it's x minus 3, becomes positive 3. Okay, and there's that theorem just on the recall. I plug it in, and ta-da, I end up with the same value. So this isn't necessarily a question you would get. I wouldn't provide a polynomial and say, what is the remainder? So why is this relevant? Why does this matter? Okay, let me prove it to you in a real world problem, because this is where it really does matter. The number of tickets sold during the Lee High School football season can be modeled by this T of X, where X is the number of games played. Use the remainder theorem to find the number of tickets sold during the 12th game of the Lee High School football season. So guess what that 12 now represents? If you guessed it, that it's your synthetic divisor, your C value, you're absolutely correct. So let's just prove it to you. So I'm going to synthetically divide it by 12 and I end up with the remainder of 650. How do I read that? That's my answer, guys. The remainder is 650. That means 650 tickets were sold during the 12th game of the season. Well, why don't I just use the theorem? Why did I do synthetic division? I did synthetic division to prove it to you. What would you have done on a question like this? Plug it in, because guess what? You get the same answer. That is the purpose of that remainder theorem is that we recognize and, and this might seem like common sense to you guys. You're reading this and you're like, yeah, if I had never learned about synthetic division, I'm pretty sure that that's what I would have done. You've just proven to yourself a concept that you've done naturally over the past few years. Okay. Now there's an example for you to try. Ah, I really hope you really do give it an option, a try. So I'm going to pause your video, attempt this question. And if you pause, welcome back. Here's your answer. This is what you should have gotten. Alrighty, let's move on to the factor theorem. So kind of based off of that remainder, we dealt with that f of c. Well, what happens when f of c doesn't equal a number value with the remainder? What if it equals zero? Well, if it equals zero, you already guessed it. This is a true factor. All right, there's that wrap up. So let's practice it. What if I wanna know, is x minus four a factor for x squared minus three x minus four? Let's prove it. I can prove using synthetic division or I can prove using the theorem. Let's see both ways. Synthetic division, boom, remainder zero. I know that if I depress this, this would be X and this would be plus, so X plus one. That would be my other factor. So I've completely factored it out. Ta-da, but what about just using the theorem? Let's plug it in. If X minus four is my X minus C, then that means four, ah, four is my C value. So let's plug that in and ta-da, you get the same answer. So I have just proven that X minus four is a factor. The only real difference here is that this simply tells me it was a factor. This gave me my other factor. But if I don't have enough information, that's kind of how you know which one to use. Am I just starting from scratch and I just have nothing to go off of, I might need to start with synthetic division and eliminate possibilities. Am I just answering, is this a factor? Use the theorem. All right, moving on. X minus four must be a factor. Moving on, example six. Are both of these factors, X minus one and X plus six? Well, let's prove it. Okay, we could use synthetic division, right? I plug in the one, I synthetically divide, I got a factor of 48, but we could also use our theorem. Okay, so, sorry, my bad. We could also have used our theorem, right? We could have plugged in F, F of one, and when it did not equal zero, you immediately knew that you had a remainder of 48, and that means it was not a factor. Two different ways you could have proved it. What about the three? So I plug in negative three, I do my synthetic division, and I got a remainder of zero. I could have also done F of negative three, and I would have gotten the answer zero. So I know X plus three is a factor. 
But what if I want to continue it down? What if I want to continue factoring it down? So if I started with x to the fourth, then that means this is now x cubed. And I could grab these values and put it in a new synthetic division and keep depressing until I get to that x squared. So since x plus 3 is a factor, we can rewrite 4x, plus, 4x to the fourth, that whole f of x, I can rewrite it as 4x cubed plus 9x squared minus 2x plus 1, x plus 3. And if you're asking yourself, where did this come from? Remember, I highlighted it in the last one. That's where those numbers came from. You know that that's the depressed form and that's the cubic form, the x cubed form. All right. So let's move on to the one that I know we struggle with the most, the rational root zero. This is the formal definition, but what does all of this mean? It means that I can find possible roots, okay? I can use synthetic division and the polynomial depression to prove it. And this one, we need a uh, formula for coefficient that doesn't equal one, and I'm gonna show it to you. So, ah, guys, when I talk about polynomial depression, we're not talking about uh, mental depression. We're not talking about being sad. We're talking about the act of physically depressing those uh, exponents, those powers from fourth to three, then three to two, and blah, blah, blah. So that's what we're talking about when we say polynomial depression. What is the purpose of the rational root theorem? It's so that you got these crazy polynomials. You have nowhere really to start to factor it. Well, you're going to take it chunk by chunk, bite by bite. All right. Two main methods. We've got if coefficient is one, then all you're really going to focus on are the factors of the constant. OK, if you don't have a coefficient of one, then you have to do the factors of the constant and the factors of the leading coefficient in this formula. If you remember my example B, I think, where I said these are just trust me that these are possible zeros. This is the formula I was referencing. That's where those numbers came from. So. Let's do an example where coefficient equals one. And you might be looking at it and saying, hold on, Miss Jag, my leading coefficient does not equal one. So then I'll ask you again, are you sure? What is the leading term? For those of you who are like, it was x cubed, you tried to trick us, you're right. So then what is my leading coefficient? One. So I don't need to worry about this. At this point, this just means I can ignore this. Okay, so look at the factors of the x to the zeroth power. I'm going to keep using this term, but guys, I'm referencing the constant. That's what I'm talking about, because technically there's an invisible x to the zeroth, just like there's an invisible one right here. So my x to the zeroth is also one. Okay, it is this number right here that I'm talking about, and its factors are one and negative one, right? Okay, I'm going to plug that into synthetic <clears throat> I'm going to plug that into synthetic division and I'm going to test. So, I plug in 1 and negative 1, but I'm specifically testing for a remainder, right? I'm specifically testing for remainder 0, so I don't have to do it into synthetic division. I can use my factor or remainder theorem to just plug it in. So, since 4 does not equal 0, 1 cannot be a factor. Since negative 2 does not equal 0, negative one cannot be a factor. So what does this mean? It means there are no possible real zeros. There are no rational zeros. So some of us are struggling with that vocab word. So let me show it to you with the graph. You can clearly see that there, there is a solution, but it's irrational. Okay, there it is, negative 0 0.453. That is a rounded value. That's not negative 0 0.453. As you can see here, I have the ellipses. It is a, uh, trans it's one of our transcendental numbers. It continues on forever, like e, like pi, like the square root of three. It has no repeater. It has no, it's just going to continue on just numbers forever and ever and ever. So that's why we say we have, an, we have a solution, but it's an irrational solution. And again, I will remind you, we're talking about the rational root theorem, okay? So what about this one? So that was kind of a prove how the rational root theorem can fail. Let's prove how the rational root theorem can help us. So what's my leading term? I didn't trick you this time. It's just x to the fourth. So that means its coefficient is one, which means I can now ignore all this information. I look at the x to the zeroth term, which is negative nine, and I get its factors, one, negative one, three, negative three, nine, negative nine. Now I'm gonna test those values with synthetic division. Don't forget to use the depressed polynomial when you get all the way down to x squared. So I have all these factors that I wrote about entirely so that I could do some animations here. And let's say I test one and negative one. Okay, so let's do that synthetic division. What are our remainders? Ooh, one is a remainder and one is actually remainder of zero. So I'm gonna ignore 
the non-zero remainder, which means I get to cross that factor out. I like this one, so I'm going to keep that one. All right, let's try 3 and negative 3. But before I do anything, I want to remember to use the depressed polynomial because I proved a real one. How did I prove a real one that's remainder 0? Because I proved a real one, then I know that this is a true factor. I could rewrite x to the fourth as um, x plus 1 times, what is that, x cubed plus 3x squared minus 3x minus 9. I could write it like that. So that's where this information comes from. So I yank that information up to another synthetic division or down or wherever it is on your paper. And now I test my next value, 3. But to save time, I'm also going to test negative 3. So we tested them. We again ended up with a non-zero and a zero. So cancel the one that doesn't affect us. Keep the one that does affect us. But do I need to test 9 and negative 9? The answer right now is no, because I got down to a depressed polynomial, ding, 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 that we like, x squared. This is x squared plus 0x minus 3. Hey, we like that. So let's go ahead. Oh, I talk about it right there. <laughs> Sorry. So this is now the depressed polynomial, x squared plus 0x minus 3. We can now factor, or of course, we can use our fail-safe, the quadratic equation. But oh, wait. It doesn't have a nice even factor. Okay, we could try the quadratic equation, but you know what? X squared minus 3, why can't I just set that equal to 0? So let's try that. Uh-oh, it's an irrational answer. The square root of 3 is not a nice, even, easy number. It's not a nice, easy decimal. It's a continuing decimal. So it is an irrational number. So I can write x squared minus 3 as a factor, but it is not one of our rational zeros. Therefore, if I rewrite this in its factored form, then the 1 becomes x plus 1, the negative 3 becomes x plus 3, and the uh, depressed form that we got on the previous slide just comes over. Again, it means I have two rational zeros at negative 1 and negative 3, and two irrational zeros at plus or minus 3. But if I go back to the fundamental theorem of algebra, x to the fourth means I have four solutions, and guess what? Four solutions. All right. What about when my coefficient cannot equal 1? really quickly. All right, so my leading term is 3x cubed, which means my leading coefficient is 3, which means I cannot ignore it. I need to use it. So those are its factors. My constants factors are these. How do we use that? Let's recall our formula, factors of the constant over factors of the coefficient. So I plug in those. I plug in those. So it's really the factors of 8 over factors of 3, and it becomes this. So now I'm going to simplify this fraction down. Excuse me. Okay, and I get these values. And if you're like, whoa, where did all these come from? Just one, you know, the one over one, the, the two over one, the four over one, the eight over one. That's where these came from. The one over three, the two over three, the four over three, the eight over three. That's where these came from. So it wasn't very hard. It just looked scary for a second. I simplify those because one over one is one, two over one. So I simplify those down. And now I get to test them. Okay, so I'm going to test with synthetic division. And I'm just going to assume that I've already tested 1, uh, negative 1, 2, and then we started negative 2 because I don't want to waste your time, and I've already proven that those have remainders. You can prove it to yourself by plugging in f of 1, f of negative 1, and f of 2, and you see that you get a real number value instead of a 0. So here's my two, negative 2. You already know what our remainder is going to be because I've already told you it should be 0. So now I have the depressed polynomial, okay? So I can factor it. 3x squared minus 13x plus 4. We can absolutely factor that out to 3x minus 1 times x minus 4. I bring down and rewrite. Ta-da! And again, this was my depressed factor. This was I when I tested the synthetic division of negative 2. That's where this came from. And that's all we got. So now I know, ah, now I know I have three real solution. X can equal negative 2, x can equal 1 third, and x can equal 4. Ta-da! All right. I'll see you guys in class. And remember, the Unit 1 exam is Friday, September the 20th.